This is Twit. Ms. Smear, a couple of questions about Android Go. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was another one of the big announcements that we saw at the keynote. Uh, what's How's that going to change what's been happening with Android One? Is that going to change anything? Yeah. Are they going to live together? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, I mean, you know, one of the things that we were really excited about, as you know, Dave mentioned, is 2 billion active devices. And when we saw that, it was like a really humbling number because we, you know, as a team, looked at that and like, wow. It's a big part of the world. It's like became yeah. the biggest operating system Crazy. ever. Um, and there's a lot of people who like their only, their first computing device is Android phone, right? Mm-hmm. And so, wow, okay. Um, and so we thought about, you know, okay, how do we get, how, how does that become three billion and four and five? And so what needs to happen? And, and this isn't the first time Google's thought about this, right? We've right. been doing stuff for a while. Um, Dave worked on Project Svelte and KitKat. I think he wrote a bunch of the code uh, for, for that, um, which is to make you know, Android run well on lower RAM devices. So it's not the first time we focus on it. You mentioned Android One. Um, Android One is a program that we started a while ago, a couple years ago, and it did three things. Um, one is it it specified hardware. So we said, look, you know, we're going to work with some manufacturers, and here's the hardware specs that you should use. Right. The second thing it did is it said, if you want to put the Android One brand on a device. Um, you need to have the Google UI for, mm-hmm. for the phone. And the third thing is if you want to put the, use the Android One brand, you need to commit to regular security updates, right. right? So it was those three things, and it was focused at the entry level of devices as well. Um, we learned a few things. Uh, one thing we learned was that um, there are a set of users out there that really like the Google UI and that really want security updates, and they aren't just at the entry level. Uh, there are mid-tier and high-end devices that people wanted that had all those things. So we changed the program. We aren't specifying the hardware anymore. We recommend hardware, but manufacturers are able to pick whatever hardware they want. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you, we have Android One as a, as a program is for the high-end, mid-tier, and entry level. So for example, we work with oh, okay. uh, the General Mobile in Turkey. Right. They have a phone which I think is like $200, $250. It's a great phone. They sell it really well there. Um, in Japan, Sharp and Kyocera have devices that are Android One devices, $400 to $500, not entry level at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you walk into like a Y Mobile store in Japan, they have like a big sign that says like Android One, and the consumer understands that that's like the Google UI and updates. So it's just we just changed the program there, and it's and that's going really well. I think Android Go is much more focused on you know how do we optimize the whole experience, and um, and that's the OS with Android O, you know, making Android O run really well on entry level devices. But it's also um, all the Google apps, right? Right. And every, you know, I've talked about YouTube Go, which is a good example of, of what we mean by the Google apps changing, right? It's like YouTube built a whole new app. Um, and then it's also the Play Store because the developers, you know, a lot of what people do on their phones are get apps from the Play Store, right? So making sure that the apps that are surfaced in the Play Store are also optimized for those those devices. And the only other thing I want to say about Go like that I think is really important. A lot of people have asked me these questions. Like, are you, is it Android light? Are you like yeah. stripping mm-hmm. stuff out? You know, yeah, that was it's as if you read my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really important thing that I, I kind of wanted to say something about. Like, I, it's not the way we think about it. Um, you know, there are features that are going to be in these apps that are on Go experience devices that are not in, they're, they're, they're not in, like YouTube Go has features that YouTube doesn't have. Mm-hmm. It's really about building for that user, not taking things away. Um, now, obviously, like the UI will, there'll be some things that get optimized, like maybe the the, you know, the fanciest animation that right. costs a lot of RAM. Right. Maybe yeah. that's not the greatest thing to do when your device is under a lot of memory pressure. Um, so maybe we don't show that. Um, but I think you know, data management is you know is a new thing we're building, yeah. um, and we'll be there front and center. Um, and that's like new features. So we don't really look at it as light. We look at it as like just building for your user. So is the idea that more third-party developers will see this and say, okay, I got to make a Go version of my app. I got to make something for the emerging market that's not dragging down their phone. Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the things that's really cool is I think a lot of developers are ahead of us here. You know, they're already working on a lot of these things, right? And so I think in part from our side, it's a recognition that, you know, we need to support that. Um, you know, there are many developers who built um, uh, who have built versions of their app, like a separate app, or they've just tuned their existing app. Right. So we, we have this like set of best practices that we put out there called Building for Billions, mm-hmm. and a lot of that is things we've learned from the developer community as well as from our own engineers um, about what works really well. Um, and I think surfacing those apps in a better way in the Play Store 
um, on these devices is something we're excited about. Is instant apps, are they a part of this movement uh, toward just making phones more usable where maybe on, data you know, is not devices. as, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to innovate and, and, and try new things. I think if you look at apps today, they're very powerful, clearly, but they're kind of siloed, right? Like, they're kind of in these, like, different, different like, places you go. Um, like, the only place they actually all come together to play is in the, in the notification shade, right? And, right? and that's, like, the one place where you see pieces from different apps. I are always thinking about, like, well, how do you reduce the friction as you get in and out of these apps and as you sort of meander your way through the experience to, trying to complete a task? And uh, instant apps are kind of exciting because what they do is they take away the friction of an installation right. step. Um, and it's more about sort of serendipitous in the moment uh, good experiences. Like a really easy one is, hey, you just park your car and there's a next generation parking meter and you can just like tap the parking meter and the parking meter app just appears. There's no install around it. You can just use it, I can pay for it and then the app goes away again. I don't need it again, right? Um, and so that's one example I like. Uh, we demoed um, at one of the keynotes the New York Times crossword app where you can just simply go in and just play it and it's gone again. It's, uh, and so we're kind of excited about it. And, and what's really cool is that these instant apps aren't a different app. It's just, just the same technology that you used to build an app. So what you can do as a developer is you can, you can take your existing app and you can sort of carve off like the top left corner of your app and that's the instant app and that comes down, the user can use it instantly. And then if the user wants to keep it, they can pin it and, they can, and the rest of the app can come down as a regular install. Um, so we're kind of excited to see how it plays out. Um, it's something very unique to Android. It's an idea that's that's unique to Android. Um, but we just want to sort of push the the innovation curve on apps and, and see, you know, we, often what we try to do as a platform is create the conditions and then see what the app developers come up well, come up with. And we're always surprised by, by the innovation that comes out. Just to, oh, just oh, to add a bit more to oh, what Dave said too, is he's exactly right about the developer experience. We thought, wouldn't it be cool if as a developer, I could have my app and it was seamless to have a full app and an instant app. Sure. In other words, we all, we're thinking of a world where there's really not a difference when I build my app between uh, instant and full. I just build my app and then there's naturally this no install version. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at what we announced in Android Studio, it, Dave's exactly right. You can now, uh, it's like, like you said, you just kind of carve off a piece of your app and that can be the instant piece. And all the tooling is designed to both help you do that factoring and then to build them easily so you can have a single code base. It's really wonderful. Uh, we've been working on the uh, developer tools side of this for uh, almost a year now. Yeah, how how uh, receptive to kind of the conversion aspect of instant apps have developers been? I, I spoke with a few developers here at I/O, yeah. and there was a little bit of fear around like, yeah, but if I get if I'm able to get somebody to actually install my app, but there's the possibility that they get what they need out of the instant app and they never install it. And I'm not able to kind of sink my hooks in a little deeper, do you know, like constant notifications or pull them further into the app and maybe right. benefit from it be living on their device when the user has decided, eh, you know what, the instant app is good enough. Well, it's actually the, one of the benefits of Android O is that there's actually not a difference between the instant and the full app. So you, when you have your instant app, if you, if you essentially, I'll call it like step over the bridge, you try to perform some action that's not supported, mm -hmm. then what it'll do is uh, pull down and install the full app. So it's, it's really a, a bridge naturally. And I think most, most of the developers that I talk to are actually incredibly excited because think about the friction it takes to get somebody to install it. Oh, for sure. I mean, if you're not, how many, if the average number of apps on a phone right now is? Different numbers cited by different yeah, sources. Yeah, as long as I have so many, I'm like so skewed. So. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I, don't it's have, I don't have a goal list up here. Yeah, 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 I, don't, I don't have a good intuition for the average. So everybody on TV <laughs> can look up your favorite data source but, uh, for today. But I, you know, I've recently seen in the vicinity of 20. So if you're not one of those 20 head apps, you yeah. know, you're, yeah. for instance, yeah. hypothetically some bank and you, you don't want to reach your right. users or uh, in an airline. And you, uh, apps are a wonderful way of creating loyalty, but it's really hard to get people to, uh, to install. And so now all of a sudden you have this magical way of just saying, hey, just just click here, right in context, and you can bring people into this fully branded, immersive experience. And then, you know, when they're ready, they can bridge uh, to the full app. But there's not that that friction step. So the developers I've talked to are incredibly excited, especially people who are not in that head. You know, obviously there's a, a subset of apps that Dave and Samir probably have on their phones right now, but most apps are not in that head. 